So welcome back. We're here with Gus Selig um, from VHCB on H232. And um, this is, well, it says it's an act relating to promoting land and home ownership and economic opportunity. Um, Gus, this bill very much affects the board makeup of VHCB and also um, asks that VHCB um, uh, enlarge their scope of mission um, beyond what's already in statute. So I just wanted to have you address it from, from, a, from this perspective. For all the years that I've done housing in this building, um, I've not really been asked to look at the board makeup of VHCB. And, um, and it's kind of a, it's not unique, but, but VHCB is a, is a uh, it's a creation of the government um, and it's not totally independent of the government. So I just, if you could just give us a little bit of history background and your thoughts on, on um, what's in this bill and what it means to VHCB, that would be great. Okay, well, um, I will do that. So for the record, I'm Gus Selig. I'm the director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And I'm long in the tooth. I was, I've been, I'm, I was the first employee hired. Um, and it is a pleasure always to be with this committee and to talk about our work. Um, and I think what this bill, let me just start by saying, I want to thank Representative Sims and Dolan and Bloomley, who've been engaged with us talking about the drafts before they were um, introduced. And we really appreciate the back and forth and the opportunity to exchange ideas. Um, very briefly, let me start by saying that we support the goals of H-232. We have some questions uh, and concerns. We'll have suggestions uh, and clarifications. There are a couple of pieces of the bill that I think from our perspective may be problematic. Um, and let me also say that we are supportive. We know that we're past crossover. So whether the bill passes this year or next, um, we will, as the board, as the bill asks, report to you um, in the in our next annual report on how we are doing as that section of the bill requires. Um, we have, and you will note, uh, Mr. Chairman, that when we submitted our annual report this year, there was a letter inside the back cover that spoke to um, the deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and, and George Floyd that we issued and that our board passed a resolution about. Um, I'd like to talk, before I dive into the specifics of the bill, um, uh, about um, uh, the role of the board um, um, and uh, the work that our partners are doing in this area, which has been going on for some time. And, but also why these issues are for me really important at a personal level. Um, and, um, and, and from my perspective, you know, we have always talked in this committee about the work of the board being about transformation. And this, I, the language is proposed, I think just asks us to think about and enhance what transformation means. Um, and I would also say to you, and I'm sure you're dealing with this in many other ways, with other legislation, um, that that this is an issue that is ripe for Vermont to address on many fronts. The governor has been challenging all of us, um, and and really from the point he became governor and spoke with the Housing and Conservation Coalition, been clear about the need to change our demographics and to welcome people to the state. And and I'll talk about that a bit. If I were in my office, and just to start with the personal, uh, and I ask you to indulge me for a minute, and I hope I don't get emotional about this. Um, if I were in my office in Montpelier, and I'm not today, um, and not most days, uh, above my desk um, sits the in frame, the program from the 1963 March on Washington. Um, and the program doesn't say that this is just a march for freedom. It said, it was a march for jobs and freedom. And I think that Dr. King understood that without economic equality, voting rights, other rights were not going to be enough to bring people into the full promise of being Americans. Um, and for me personally, and I was, you know, a little kid that day, um, I'm not that old, um, though I know I look old. Um, 
the movement was really at the center of our home life. Uh, my stepmother's dad was a, um, uh, an associate of Roy Wilkins and actually served as the national secretary of the NAACP. My dad's work was as a labor organizer with the union you now know as SEIU, and he um, organized primarily um, African-American and Hispanic people who did what we all know to be essential work today and call essential work uh, as the people who worked as nurses' aides and orderlies and cleaning staff and janitorial staff and food workers in hospitals and nursing homes. And I think when I was 12 uh, across New York City, they won a major strike. And those the headline was that their salaries went from $80 a week to $100 a week. Um, he died at a very young age in an auto accident and, and just really filled um, the Riverside Church, a large church in New York, um, was overflowing that day with the folks that he had worked with. Um, um, my summer camp, uh, and uh, excuse me for this, but music's important part of our lives. I'm sure Representative Bloomley and maybe some of you know uh, the, the music of Bernice Reagan Johnson. She took several summers away from the civil rights movement to, uh, she's the founder of a group called Sweet Honey in the Rock, to be the music counselor at camp. So our Passover satyrs were filled with the songs that she taught us. Um, uh, at camp. Um, and I note that while we're in the midst of the, the trial dealing with uh, George Floyd's death, I opened the Times Argus today to see that it's Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and I know you've been working on the eugenics issue. Uh, my mom is a Hungarian immigrant who arrived here in August of 1939 um, as a six-year-old. And I've only been to the Holocaust Museum uh, once in my life. I was in DC. It's a uh, pretty heavy experience to go in there, but there is this bin and in my memory, I was only there for a couple hours, a bin probably 10 by 15 feet, just filled with shoes. And they are the shoes of people who did not survive. And you walk by it and you wonder, were some of those shoes, shoes of cousins or aunts or uncles? Um, and um, and I would not be here today had she not gotten to this country that August. And probably if it had been December or January, that well, three, four months later, perhaps she would not have been here at all. Um, the work that I've done um, at VHC and before that at the organization that's known as Capstone has been at this center of and the follow-up to what I think of as the civil rights movement, expanding economic opportunity and access um, uh, and, and fighting for inclusion um, for all folks. Um, so while this does expand our mission, uh, some years ago, uh, you expanded our mission by David Dean, when he was chair of Fish and Wildlife, called me up one day and said, can we make water quality part of your mission? And I said to him, gee, I always thought that it was. Um, and he said, well, can we make it explicit? And I said, of course. Um, so I, I see the, the, um, the need to do this as fundamental to not just our board, but I think uh, many boards and many organizations across the state. Um, and, and just, to, to just to add a little bit more perspective for me, um, my uh, the, when I first started at Community Action, uh, Representative Walls probably remembers a fellow named Ben Collins, who was then the executive director. He had been part of the Hoff administration, um, was his secretary of civil and military affairs. And when he left Governor Hoff's work, uh, it, as a em direct employee, he became the director of the New York Vermont Youth Project. Um, those of you who know the history of that time know how controversial that project was, a partnership between the governor and Mayor Lindsay in bringing inner city youth to Vermont. Twenty some years later, um, I was working with the Vermont Land Trust when they received a gift of a farm in Reading and they turned it into, they found a, a had a proposal and somebody wanted to operate it again for inner city youth 
And in the early 90s, the same controversies and ugliness hit them. Um, uh, those of you who saw the civil unions debate in our state house know how hard a debate that was. Um, in 2007 um, or 2008, I recall reading a column just before the Barack Obama's election by Frank Rich, who was at one time the drama critic for the New York Times and had become an op-ed writer. And he was talking about the song South Pacific, the musical and the song about the need, about how we need to be taught to hate. And we don't, we're not born hating people. Um, we are, we are taught it. And, and so it's clear to me from all the events of the last year and from the reality that, that, that we still have difficulty in Vermont, that we have work to do on a policy level, we have work to do to create better understanding, to build more bridges, um, to open people's hearts. And if we don't do that work, we won't be the welcoming state that we want to be and need to be um, for any number of reasons. So our work today, I think, has always we've always described our work as I said a moment ago about as being about transformation, and I think you're just the sponsor of this bill of this bill are asking us to think about transformation in a broader and larger sense. Um, I just want to note one other thing which I, I meant to say a moment ago. One of the books I'm reading right now is a, Isabel Wilkerson's book on on cast, um, and you've probably discussed it. I didn't listen to. You discussions about eugenics, but I, I'm just 80, 90 pages into it and not surprised, but of course, horrified to read that um, two years after the Hitler was elected in Nazi Germany, there was a, he pulled together 17 bureaucrats to figure out how they were going to pass racial laws and where did they look but to American eugenicists and to American law to figure out what they would do. So I know for some people, the, the question of, of these issues is a hard one to deal with, but it is so ingrained in our culture that we have a lot of work to do to overcome a long legacy here. Um, to speak to the board's mission uh, for a moment um, and to move away from the personal, um, I view our work as about being about inclusion and about access. You give us funding every year to provide access to housing and to land. And, uh, and you ask us to focus on um, the people who are economically at, at the bottom of the ladder. And in fact, some years ago, um, Senator Luzzi actually added to our statute asking us to focus on areas of the state that are of high unemployment and low per capita income. Um, and we know that people of color, indigenous peoples have suffered economically. So certainly that that is there as a part of our statute. In terms of our, our mission, we are clearly a funder of projects. And that's what we do with most of the funding you provide us. We also provide technical assistance to our community partners um, we function, we do research about various topics related to the mission. So we are just getting a report on farm labor housing, again, a sector of our housing that is housing people um, of modest means and uh, probably a much higher percentage of people of color. We've, we've um, and we function as a convener and we have for a number of years been bringing people, our partners, the nonprofits we work with regularly, but others as well together around issues of power and privilege and diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, and there are a number of projects we've funded that, that I think speak um, very much to these issues. Um, and they include fund, having funded the Daisy Turner Homestead in Southern Vermont. They include supporting the Clemens Farm, working with the Vermont Land Trust on the Pine Island Farm. I'm pleased to tell you that the Champlain Housing Trust um, has been hard at work on these issues for a number of years. And I think they report a quarter of their residents are persons of color. Um, we're about, we just funded what will be a new development in downtown Winooski, a, a home ownership development for 21 homeowners. And they're 
working with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, and we'll do extensive outreach and work to have uh, people of color become some of the homeowners there. So there's a lot of work going on. We are convening both our housing and conservation partners on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We, we are putting together um, uh, three different sets of activities. One will be workshops on issues like uh, that we think block inclusion, like using credit scoring to determine who gets into housing, um, uh, criminal background checks. And I, I think CHT would tell you that as they have looked at who gets into their housing, despite their good work, despite the fact that 15% of their staff are people of color, they are reviewing their policies around using criminal background checks and using credit scoring because they turn down more people of color than they turn down people who are not. And so they know that they still have work to do despite their success. Um, so there's a lot of good work going on on this issue, but we're at the beginning of a journey. We are spending time with our own staff on these issues at our staff meetings. Uh, Representative Colston spoke to our board at our board retreat, and we've done some follow-up work there. So the time is absolutely right for um, for our statute. Um, to get into the um, statute in particular, um, I guess what I would say to you that is that the two most important parts of the statute from my perspective is the uh, is in section 322, the allocation system where you ask us to expand uh, access to low to land and home ownership to Vermonters who've historically suffered discrimination or unequal access to benefits and services, including black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, I think that that's very powerful and really important. And then second, um, in, you, in the annual report section of our legislation, you ask us specifically, uh, the, or the proponents do, to identify, uh, uh, section five in the annual report is to identify and evaluate, provide an identification and evaluation of structural barriers that are contributing to racial, ethnic, and economic disparities in housing and home ownership and access to publicly supported open spaces, actions that the board is taking to remove barriers and to increase equity and access to board supported programs and metrics to monitor progress in removing those disparities. Um, I think just as adding a few words that made explicit um, that we should protect the surface waters of the state, those things will have an enormous impact on us and by translation um, to our partners who we will ask for more information. We've already in our annual grants, asked everybody to report on these issues. Uh, no surprise, the organizations that have the most resources, uh, the largest organizations are way ahead and working hard on this. And that's very small organizations with staffs of two or three, you know, report that they're doing all they can to obey the fair housing laws and they need help. Um, and that's why we're doing the convening and the workshops that we will be doing, but we're, we're anticipating a speaker series. Uh, we've been talking with the Community Foundation, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston to financially help support that work. Um, and I think we will, we will get that kind of support along with a national affiliate. We work with NeighborWorks America. Um, and we're planning a leadership series where we will br bring leaders together to talk about how this work can be done effectively. So those are, our short-term plans for how to be involved in this. Um, to this section of the bill that we have some questions or issues about, um, I guess uh, you should hear from our conservation partners on section 325, which suggests that all of our easements should provide for gathering for indigenous people. Um, we, um, we are open to that uh, as a suggestion. I think the pushback will be that there are already use agreements in place and it is better to put those things in something we call management plans rather than conservation easements themselves. And so that's something we should certainly take up and discuss at a future time. 
Um, we also have um, a question in the definitions section about whether and how um, the language proposed would play out um, and whether, uh, and what it says is, it, what it does is creates a new category of housing projects eligible for, for funding. And it says housing that serves Vermonters who've historically suffered discrimination or unequal access to benefits and services, including black, indigenous, and people of color. And our questions on that section go to the question of whether it is the um, proponent's intent to make that housing available to such households, regardless of their income, uh, because at this point, only people who are below 100% of median as rental housing or 120% of median for homeowners are eligible for the housing. So it's just, it's one of those things that is unclear. It's also unclear how we will define, um, how this will be defined. Uh, so if you imagine a household applying for an apartment or someone trying to determine and document if they fall into this category, um, what does discrimination mean um, through history? Uh, certain nationalities, those with disabilities, um, are all just, we need to, to, to discuss that. Um, our most significant concern about the bill, well, let me, before I get into significant concern, let me just also say to you, um, uh, in terms of our, our board, I, sh I should talk about the work that our board does uh, so you have a clear picture of it. And um, before I do that, I do, do want to tell you, uh, and you may have seen, because there, there was a public announcement, uh, the, the governor had an opening on the board and he has appointed Clarence Davis of Shelburne to the board. Those of you who know Clarence know that he um, has served on the Burlington City Council in a past life. He's worked in housing. Um, and when Martha Maxim was ill, uh, Governor D Scott appointed him as the interim deputy secretary at the Agency of Human Services. So uh, we we had a board that had a majority of women on it, and we now will have a person of color also serving with us, assuming the Senate confirms him. Uh, so that's the good news. Um, to give you a sense of the work of our board, um, and we are our board is currently 11 members. We had been nine originally. Um, we have four ex officios on our board and seven citizens. Um, three of the ex officios are members of the administration. They are the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Natural Resources, and the Secretary of Human Services. The fourth is the Director of the Housing Finance Agency. So three members of the governor's cabinet. There is a value to having any governor's cabinet, uh, even if it's a governor that we're where we are not the favorite favorite program, having that that interaction on our board for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them, I think, is embedded in the great work Vermont has done around smart growth. Um, so we have historically had people across agencies talking to each other and having to figure out what their differences are and had a blend policy. Um, we would, um, the bill proposes that the Secretary of Human Services no longer be on the board. I don't think we can support that. And I think at this particular moment um, in our history, um, as we try to get more than 2000 Vermonters out of motels and into housing, uh, and knowing that a large number of those people need services, uh, the connection with the Human Services Agency and having them at the table is is really important. Um, in, the board is a working board. Um, we meet usually um, six to seven times a year and have a board retreat as well. The board meetings, because we try to move those that take place not during the legislative session around the state, usually take a full day. Um, there's usually... A, something in the order of a half day or more of prep time. There's also committee work. Um, as you deal with the issue of all boards and commissions and not, which goes beyond the scope of H-232, one of the things I will tell you about getting more people who are represented on boards, whether it's our board, the Housing Finance Agency, um, perhaps boards like the Healthcare Board or the Human Services Board are different 
uh, well, the health, the healthcare board actually pays a salary. The human services board, I think, pays just the stipend. In 1987, when I began this work, um, the stipend for somebody serving on a state board was $50. It is $50 33, 34 years later. Um, and that that is a barrier uh, for working people. Uh, it is a barrier for people of modest means. So it's something I just suggest to you, you need to consider. Um, our board is, is a hardworking board. And one of the great things about it right now is that it is unusual for us to have less than nine or 10 members at a board meeting. Um, they're very engaged. They're very active. In my experience and in the training I've had about board development, the larger a board gets, um, sometimes the less participation you, you get in a board. Not only do they review and approve most of the grants and loans that the board makes, they are the keepers of policy, they're the keepers of the balance sheet, they have responsibility for supervising, hiring and firing an executive director, they aid us greatly in strategic thinking, and they're a bridge because of the the combination of citizen members and members of the cabinet. Uh, they are a bridge bridges for partnership. Um, um, so, and they have helped us resolve, and I think we have helped them resolve conflicts among state agencies just because the, that dialogue goes on. I would also say to you that citizens end up being the backbone of the board. In the early years, the ex officios all attended themselves. In more recent years, we get designees. Uh, and that's a little different uh, when you have a staff person rather than a secretary or a commissioner. So the citizen members are really important um, to us. Um, and finally, we need board members uh, in general, uh, who both bring expertise, but have an interest in things beyond their area of expertise. So if we get a, somebody who is only interested in natural resources, and we have a lot of discussion about housing, um, they're going to be bored out of their minds and feel like they're wasting their time. And we've had that experience uh, when we have had, and, and it would be true the other way around too, if we have so, and it is, what we need and what we've had most of the time have been really good problem solvers, good thinkers, broad perspectives. Um, David Marvin, who some of you may know, uh, he's the principal at Butternut Mountain Farm, great forestry background. Um, they bottle about half the maple syrup that's made in Vermont. He's a consulting forester and he's a great community person and problem solver. And he gets our housing mission as well as any housing expert you are ever gonna come across and has a sensitivity from a Lamoille County perspective. Um, so uh, so that's, I think, what we need in a board. Um, and I guess, so I would suggest to you that that our biggest problem with, this, with what's been proposed is losing the Secretary of Human Services as a member of the board um, and I know we had a discussion with the proponents of the bill about expanding the board. Um, I think the statute, uh, the, the, the amendments as proposed, um, I think unintentionally add a 12th member. Um, we don't, I, uh, we, we were happy to talk more about it, but I think just growing the board is not, will end up producing less engagement. We, the Speaker of the House appoints two members of the board. Uh, the president of the Senate, uh, all, along with a committee of committees, also appoints members. And I think it's incumbent upon all of the appointing authorities, and I think this should be in the bill, to consider people who will represent commu communities of color, uh, represent people who've been marginalized on the board, and we will work with them on that. Um, the last thing I'll say to you, and then I'll stop, because uh, I feel like I've been talking a long time, uh, is that we have to show up in your committee every year and in the Appropriations Committee. And we will submit annual reports on the progress we make on these issues. 
and our statute has been amended sometimes in the appropriations bill. And so this is not the last discussion we'll have about how we should be accountable on this or any other set of issues uh, with you. And, um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to advance these issues. But, but those are our quick reactions, maybe not too quick, uh, um, to the bill as proposed. So I'm happy to answer your questions. Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Gus, um, for all the great work you do. I wonder, Gus, if you have any uh, aggregated baseline demographics of the loans, the, the money you've given out to the agencies, who, who has been served by that? Well, what I can tell you, you know, the Champlain Housing Trust is our largest housing provider. Um, and we know that something like 25% of their rental residents are people of color. I don't know if we have that data for all of our partners. We know that across the state, we're at about outside of Burling, outside of the Champlain Housing Trust, which with whom we've done half of our home ownership deals, we're at about 3% for persons of color. And that's why we've been engaged in this dialogue and education and learning. Um, you know, on the farm side, one of the things our, we are doing right now is working with a new group, the New England Farmers of Color Land Trust, um, as a service provider in our farm and forest viability program and in our farmland access work. And in the same way, you know, the Champlain Housing Trust has reached out and worked with the Alliance of Africans Living in Vermont, um, we will need, and I think our, our housing partners will need help. I don't know that we have built that kind of infrastructure in parts of the state outside of Chittenden County. And I can try to get you a more precise answer to your question about who's being served. What I can tell you as a matter of income, as opposed to, um, as opposed to ethnicity or race is that um, in, in tax credit housing, something like 58% of the residents of tax credit housing, which we are a funder of, are people who are extremely low income. And the, the, uh, that's like second or third highest in the country, uh, maybe highest uh, the last time we checked, um, and way higher than most other states. So if, if low income extremely low income is a is one barometer of whether people have a, a background in that suggests that they are from a marginalized community we are probably uh, doing pretty well but I do not have more precise numbers than that for you today and obviously when we report to you uh, in our next annual report we will try to give you more precise information and do you have statistics on people with disabilities that have also been serviced through all of the money? Um, I believe that we do. We've also done about what we call service supported housing. Um, and so of the 13,000 homes and apartments that we have funded about 1400 are, the, there are disabled people absolutely in all of our regular housing, but so in addition to that, um, we have done projects all over the state. Um, we helped with the closing of the Brandon Training School um, greatly, as one example. There are uh, there's a but there are all kinds of in your neck of the woods. Uh, there's one project that we did um, that is for people for adults with. Uh, very significant mobility impairments. And there, uh, there's another project we did that's a partnership with the Howard Center for people struggling with persistent mental illness. Um, lots of housing for frail elders. Um, uh, we've worked with most of the organizations that serve battered women in the state. Um, so there, there is a long history of working with the disabled community. Yeah. And, just, and as a matter of our standards, all of our housing needs to be accessible. We also run a program 
through the Vermont Center of Independent Living that, uh, that provides accessibility improvements to people who need ramps, bathroom, or kitchen modifications. Thank you. You know, I think that statistics of uh, everything will help me to understand who has been left out. And as we, as we look into this bill, the framework of, of who ne needs to be let in. Well, when uh, we had our walkthrough with our legal counsel, David Hall, he said that he urged us to be consistent with a number of these bills we are working on in terms of the, the kind of framework of, um, you know, who, who is this, what, what, what impact of communities are we trying to reach here? And so, you know, I just, um, I, I think that the more statistics we have, it'll be helpful to understand. Um, right, and that's why I said, I know this bill is being considered after crossover and my first yeah. commitment is, though it likely won't pass this year, that in our annual report, we will try to get you information more quickly than that, but we will, um, utilize the proposed language for our annual report as a lever to say, when you come in next January, we'll give you an extensive report on how we're working on all these issues. But I'll Great. try to get you more data sooner than that. Thank you so much. Senator Trent. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Um, you did touch on this, Gus, um, that there are certain criminal convictions that eliminate um, the possibility of Section 8 vouchers for housing. Um, now, I wasn't sure the context in which you presented it. Um, are we working to change that? I mean, for instance, an assault conviction can eliminate you from a Section 8 housing voucher. Um, and that always seemed unfair to me. And in, and in my work, I had to work hard on a number of cases to try and get something done so that that would not happen to an individual who relied heavily on that, obviously, on a on a Section 8 voucher? Um, I can't speak to, and Jen may be able to help me, about the rules around Section 8 vouchers. We do a lot of housing that does not involve uh, Section 8. And, and I'm just saying that most uh, property management companies, most property management, when you're screening tenants, they use both credit scoring and criminal background as an issue. And what I am Tell, telling you is that I, I, they they don't necessarily have to s eliminate somebody from consideration because of that. But I think that those are issues. We have one organization that actually does not use credit scoring to qualify people for their housing down in Southern Vermont. And I think there's more to be learned about that and by the whole network about when do you put aside a low credit score and say, we're going to take you in anyway. And I think a similar question around criminal background checks, you know, that we have a whole program across Vermont, not in my expertise, there's probably somebody on the committee that's more familiar about restorative justice. Um, and so the fact that somebody once made a mistake shouldn't mean you can't ever rent an apartment again. I do want to say, as we examine the issue of structural barriers, um, you know, and particularly as it pertains to home ownership, there are problems that go well beyond what the board can do. And so, you know, if a bank will not accept somebody for a mortgage, it doesn't matter if we're going to provide a subsidy. They just will not get through. So there are going to be structural barriers that we're going to uncover that go beyond what the board can do. But I do think that looking at those issues as two examples of why people do not get housed or what makes it harder are really important. Thank you, Gus. Further questions for Gus or Jen? No, Gus, I um, thank you for coming in and thank you for sharing your, you, you, you have never come into our committee to share personal stories. And I wanna just acknowledge that you did and, and appreciate it. Um, sharing that, that was, I was struck in the Holocaust Museum by the same, the same thing you saw. The Holocaust Museum is so full of um, replicas 
but when I turned the corner into the room where the shoes were, you could smell them. And that was really this, that sense memory of, of was, was just, just, just rocketed through my system. So thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Um, committee will stop right here. This is, um, as with most of our work, this is not a simple little bill, um, no matter what the intent is behind it. So um, we will um, pick up testimony on this next week as well um, from some of the people mentioned where we have invitations out. So we'll, we'll follow up on this bill. Okay, and, and we will offer some language in a few places if, we can, if that would be okay, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Yep. Um, no, thank you, committee. Let's um, let's finish here. Um, and we are. I'm just trying to see what what our schedule is for this afternoon. Um, we are back this afternoon to um, time permitting to walk through H two seventy three, which is a different take on some of the issues that we've talked about this morning. So thank you all.